Hey everyone, back again. Today I want to talk about Sophia Noble's idea of algorithmic oppression, which comes from her text titled Algorithms of Oppression. Now before jumping into it, hi, I'm David. I try to explain philosophical concepts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new here, uh, you can go and check out however many hundreds of videos I already have up. Uh, if you are new, like, share, subscribe, so you can see videos I release every single week, sometimes twice a week. If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it in podcast form pretty much anywhere where you get podcasts. Or if you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find it on YouTube if you want the video for that. If you want to help me out do all those things, you can also help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. And uh, yeah, let's jump into this pretty important term that Sophia Noble gives us here. So this, like I mentioned, comes from her text titled algorithms of oppression, which I highly recommend. I haven't actually done on here on this channel yet. Uh, so if, if this gets enough, enough likes, I'll go and do it. But uh, until then, I haven't done it. So this term is referring to the ways in which algorithms reflect the basic discriminatory elements of everyday society, which is to say that despite the fact that algorithms and big data are often viewed as being neutral or benign, that is simply just reflecting things or just doing what people tell them, in, the, in that fact that they operate at the behest of people, both directly, that is both consciously and unconsciously, they are going to reflect those people's basic uh, beliefs. And if those beliefs happen to be discriminatory ones or ones that contain prejudice, those algorithms, that big data, big information, the internet, are all going to repeat those cycles, are all going to contribute to the same kind of discrimination. So the most easy example maybe to illustrate this is the different search results that we're going to get if we went to Google and typed in the search bar black man versus white man. Now I want to caveat this by saying that after Noble wrote this book, and after there was a lot of outcry from the black community, this has changed somewhat. So it has gotten quote unquote better, that is the representation of black people versus white people has gotten better, but we can still see many of these trends appear. That is black men mostly are gonna be depicted in more negative light it, through these, these search engines than will white men. And the same with youth, as well. Now, algorithms are interesting because they are going to reflect both their creators, so the people that made them contributed to their coding and everything, but also because today they've grown so ubiquitous, they're going to reflect the interests of the broader public and their views. Because as people use them, and this is what is referred to machine as machine learning and other kinds of uh, neural learning mechanisms, these AI, this software, these algorithms, which aren't all the same thing, but anyways, are going to learn to adapt to accommodate what are basic trends and are going to be able to pick up trends and are going to be able to realize what people might ask. So this is why if you go to Google and you typed in something like, why is my, you'll see a bunch of filled in things, different options as to what you could fill in with following what is my, and it'll tell you, it'll give you these options that you can click on because these are things that people have been looking up. And this reveals the extent to which these algorithms are largely in league with everyday culture. Now, the internet, now tech, aren't always the most accessible things. They are going to be, and this was certainly true at the beginning of their uh, entrance on the world stage and especially in uh, Western countries in North America and, and so on, it was largely those people who could afford this tech, could afford this technology, they could access it. And it would continue on like that for a long time, even very much to this day. So the interests of the algorithm are then going to reflect those people who are most likely to access them, to be able to access the internet, to be able to use the internet, and are there going to reflect the, those interests which are often gonna go along class and racial and in many ways gender lines. Now Noble is very clear, and I think that this is one of her better points, that this is not new. Really the kind of discrimination that we see on the internet is not new, and the kind of discrimination that is facilitated and in many ways cultivated by uh, these algorithms aren't actually new. They in fact are just another way by which old forms of discriminatory, 
discriminatory beliefs come to be packaged and come to be disseminated to a broader public. Now, just because it might not be totally new doesn't mean that there are now not new opportunities afforded by these kinds of discriminatory acts or discriminatory images and messaging that gets distributed. There aren't new opportunities for these discriminatory images and messages to have more deleterious effects and contribute to various cycles of oppression that are going to target largely uh, racial gender minorities and so on. And one of the examples that she gives in the book is from a, a black hairdresser. Now this woman's name is Candace and Candace was working in a largely, uh, was working in a university town. And Candace describes how uh, at the time when she was working, especially in the early 2000s, uh, the mid to early 2000s, the 2005, 6, 7 era, when people first started to get phones, she found that there was, go there was uh, a big reduction in the amount of people that would actually show up at her uh, establishment. And this was largely due as well to the fact that there were uh, diminishing, um, there was a reduction of black enrollment at this university, which was produced by a number of other systemic factors. But in any case, she describes the way in which largely white students would be using various apps and one that we can think of today, like Yelp, for example, but at, but at the time, uh, they'd be communicating online about what the best places to go to were for hairdressing. And because most of them were white, they wouldn't actually go to black owned hairdressers and you know the, the kinds of experience that is needed to work on black hair versus white hair, certainly these things are different. So white students would go to hairdressers who knew how to, who were proficient with working with mostly white hair. And so what would happen was they would use those as being, they would, they would amplify those businesses because of their proficiency with white hair, which comes to negatively affect black owned businesses because all of a sudden it becomes a lot harder for people who are trying to look for places online to find black owned or black run hairdressers in this case that can actually work on black hair because white people hair and white people's interests are being more reflected because there are more of them on the app, more of them are more willing to leave like good reviews on good places, they have more uh, social clout, and that will reflect in these algorithms that are gonna have this effect upon all of these other businesses, largely businesses run by marginalized individuals. So by looking at the way that these algorithms function, we can get a very good peek into how discrimination really operates at, uh, at a cultural level and figure out whose interests are gonna be reflected the most. Just because we know that algorithms, the internet, search engines are so ubiquitous, by looking at the ways in which, or looking at who these algorithms come to represent in, the, in a positive light versus a negative light, we can come to see in society at large, who are the ones that are gonna benefit the most versus those who are going to be uh, depicted in a certain way, stereotyped and kept within a certain cycle or loop of oppression in all of its different forms. And it's important not to look at technology and say that it is technology contributing to this. Sure, it plays some part and it has to be interrogated for its many negative uh, effects, especially big data gathering, especially, uh, you know, the predatory extraction of resources, extraction of data from users, you know, with other consent and so on, the rendering completely superfluous of gig workers because of the um, continually diminishing and the continually, continually diminishing condition of workers, forcing people to constantly be leaving uh, one form of employment, causing a lot of turnover, so there's always an ample supply of new workers ready to come into these crappy jobs. All of these things need to be interrogated that the internet and all of the cultures around it come to foster. But it would be totally wrong to just look at today and say that everything, all of our problems begin with today. And this is something I like to call, and I, I don't know if anyone else has said this, and I, if, if someone has, please tell me and then I can credit them. Uh, but I like to call this the black mirror effect where people uh, look at technology as being the ultimate culprit as to what's going on, forgetting that many of the things that technology really um, depicts in terms of our 
negative aptitudes is rather just an extension of those historical ones and it has just provided us uh, or has amplified what has long existed beforehand. So I hope that served as a fair introduction to this term, algorithmic repression and how it works. Really, uh, Sophia Noble is without parallel when it comes to this discussion and I highly recommend you go check that out. Uh, but yeah, if you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends, who knows, they might get a kick out of it. And yeah, catch you next time, take care.